play. And another, another foul on Ward. His third for setting a screen. Because of physical play, although George Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Kick and roll. And a foul. Offensive foul coming up again. Battle Fox hit it right there. See? Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Moving Screen Podcast. I'm Brendan Quinn from The Athletic, here with Dylan Burkhardt, UM Hoops. It is Thursday, April 30th, uh, day, I don't know, of uh, isolation, lockdown. It's uh, pretty normal at this point, but Dylan's hair, for those who can't see my screen, um, is very representative of... uh, I think the state of our country, it is flat, disheveled, overgrown, generally disrupted. (laughs) That's about how I feel at this point. Um, How you doing, bud? You holding in there? I'm holding in there. How about yourself? I'm I'm well. I'm well. Um, Yeah, maintaining. Maintaining. We'll see if we get some golf in in June. The PGA opens things up. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Otherwise, just keep waiting. Just keep waiting. (laughs) But we have a... uh, This this week, as you all probably know, um, the deadline for entries to the NBA draft passed. And we thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of go through the... How many players, Dylan? I think there's 14 players from the Big Ten. The 14 players who are currently draft eligible have their name um, in the pool and are testing the waters to use all the cliches. Um, and we'll be able to kind of touch on every team as as we go through this. So we'll talk about their draft decisions and we'll talk about what it means to each team. Uh, so kind of a Big Ten-centric pod here. Um, this is obviously free. For everyone out there, we hope that you are subscribed to this podcast. We hope you've told your friends. We hope that you've left a review. Um, and most importantly, we hope that you have subscribed to both of our uh, our sites because that's how we actually get paid. So uh, Dylan, um, who runs UM Hoops by himself, and uh, as we all know right now, people who are kind of self-sustained need support. So uh, Dylan on UM Hoops. Right now, uh, what do you have? What do you have cooking? So this week uh, we have a big recruiting deep dive. Uh, Juwan Howard Ooh. back out, sending a lot of scholarships off offers out over the weekend, diving into that 2021 class. So we have video and some analysis on some of those kids. Uh, we're gonna have a couple other fun stories coming up in the next couple of days. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And we're just going about what we've been doing basically this is the current reality and covering college basketball as news comes to happen yeah how about you over at the athletic just doing what you do um so i had from earlier this week aaron henry declared for the draft i was able to uh get his father james to uh kind of have a lengthy conversation about what's going into the decision um to to enter the draft in the first place and then what's going to kind of weigh here as they go along. I found it pretty interesting. Um, so that's up there now. Um, the athletic for kind of the top 15 programs or so in the country is doing mock drafts where three writers will pick, um, this kind of funny. historical teams and, uh, and build rosters. And then, uh, we are taking those teams and going to, a coach or ex player for analysis of the roster. So, uh, we've done at Michigan state. It was me, Seth Davis and the great James Edwards. And, uh, we picked our teams. I took them to Tom Izzo and, uh, he offered his insight as only he can. Um, this week, uh, this has not been posted yet, but myself, Nick Baumgartner and Brian Hamilton selected, all-time Michigan teams, and I caught up with John Beeline yesterday, and he went over the uh, the lineups with me, and so that will be posted soon. I also have a Big Ten preview coming this week. 
I spoke to Franz Wagner last week about his decision not to test the NBA waters. That's posted. All kinds of stuff. Um, an interview with Pierre Brooks, uh, Michigan State's latest commitment. So check all that out on The Athletic, um, along with everything else from my uh, wonderful coworkers. No one drafted Gary Harris. What was up with that? I know. I know. I I felt like I was between Gary Harris and Charlie Bell in with my last pick, and I 100% should have taken Gary Harris. Uh, I feel like he was a little like a blind spot there. Definitely. I, I will I will not argue that fact. I appreciated Izzo's comments after, though. That was enjoyable, though. <laughs> He's not one to hold back. Uh, so... That was all good. I'm trying to think of who else. Like, my problem was my guards were Cassius Winston, Scott Skiles, um, and Sean Respert. And I kind of wanted a, I don't know. It, I mean, it would have been great to draft Gary Harris. I, I completely dropped the ball. <laughs> Defensive wing. <who> can, <laughs> Defensive wing. It'd be perfect. Shoot threes and make a billion dollars in the NBA. Probably would have been the right pick there as, as opposed to Charlie Bell. But I also needed – I didn't have a single player from Flint. So, you know, I didn't want James to get mad at me. So I needed to right, step it up. Fair. All right. <laughs> let's, hope, let's hope you draft a better uh, Michigan team. So give us a tease. Who did you draft – First on the Michigan team, and was it just Beeline era players, or is no? It all the we way we back? went from the '89 team on, right? So okay. including '89 and forward. Um, okay. So I had the back end of the snake, so I had picks three and four. So it's okay. e- it's easy to imagine who went one and two, and then I took. Um, Trey and Juwan okay. Howard. Okay, you get. I feel like I was not very kissing up to, for the narrative with you. I was not kissing up to the uh, to the coach. Okay. All right. Well, I'll check that out. <laughs> it seemed it seemed like the most reasonable pick in that spot. Peak quarantine content, but I'm here for big it. time. Absolutely, and we are not we are not shy about it. <laughs> we will say what it is. So, all right, let's get into this thing, though. Do you want to go? Uh, you just want to go in alphabetical order by team? I want to start with Michigan State because I'm curious about Aaron Henry declaring at the last minute your conversation sure. with his father and what you think about that. Let's let's start there. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about Livers or about uh, Henry and like even speaking to his father was, you know, if you were really paying attention at the end of the year when Michigan State really kind of got going down the stretch – a big part of that was Aaron Henry was playing really well. Um, he was much closer to the guy, I think, that we all envisioned all along. And the production was there. The confidence was there. The shot making was there. Um, in addition to being kind of this do-it-all defender. Um, and he was trending in the right way. And they were anticipating, including Aaron, they were anticipating him go- f- carrying that forward, having a great Big Ten tournament. And then going right into the NCAA tournament, maybe putting together two, you know, terrific performances on that big stage. And in that scenario, I don't even think it would be testing. I think it would be gone Um, because he's a guy who you can envision going to the combine testing really well. You know, he's this 6'6", 220 pound, solid as a rock. Um guy who's going to do you know all the testing really well all the physical attributes um looks good in workouts and uh they would probably have just gone and seen what what he could do and what's a pretty weak draft overall um obviously he didn't have that opportunity i think in his my read on it was that in his mind he felt ready that this was going to happen and that was not able to just completely shake that feeling. And that has ultimately led to him entering the draft and kind of seeing what he can do. They're not blind to the fact that this is all shrouded in uncertainty with the current situation. And uh, dad was not shy about saying he thinks it's going to be best for him to return to school. Um, You know, in what is a really good support system around 
Aaron Henry, his dad has a kind of primary role in that. So him thinking that he should be back at school carries legitimate weight. But look, Aaron Henry is a confident dude who's had a really kind of not stressful, but somewhat strained kind of college tenure of trying to find his confidence, trying to kind of find an equilibrium to his play that hasn't really gotten there yet. Um, whether that means he wants to play or wants to move on, I think internally they think he's going to be a better pro than he is a college player. So, you know, what does that lead you to do? Who knows? But um, that's kind of where things stand. Yeah, I feel like both of Aaron Henry's seasons have sort of had to work through some struggles early in the year, and then he finds that sweet spot or equilibrium late in the year where he strings together five or six games and everyone's like, well, holy shit, this is the guy we were talking about. Like, and you have to go back and figure out how come in December and November that wasn't there and what really creates some of that. Um, Yeah. If he kept playing like he was over the last five or six games in the NCAA tournament, Michigan state season probably would have kept going on and Mm -hmm. people would have been talking about Aaron Henry, just like they were at the end of last year. And then you're coming back and just stuck in this cycle of you're going to take the next step. And then early in the year, he just couldn't really do that this year. And he was judged through that lens of I expect him to be this star guy who's going to have a breakout sophomore season. And he played well down the stretch, but I don't think he ever quite got to that level of what people expected of him. Right. So it is an interesting decision. Um, Do you think. He would. Do you think his decision at all would be tied to what Xavier Tillman does as far as like the roles of everyone coming back on next year's team or not so much? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I think regardless of if Tillman is back, he's, they have a pretty firm understanding of what Aaron's role is going to look like. They're going to have to play through him a lot more without Cassius mm-hmm. and with it, the, all this uncertainty at the point guard position. He's he's had that experience of bringing the ball up and engaging the offense. He's had that experience of of seeing the offense go through him a little bit on the wing. Um, I think both of those areas will be expanded upon, um, regardless of if Tillman is there or not. Right. So. You know, the, I think they know the deal that if he's back, he's playing 35 minutes a game. He's going to be a focal point of this team and uh, he'll have every opportunity to do what he can do. And I actually think with him, the team getting, you know, starting to trend younger and so much attention on Rocket Watts and all this stuff. I do feel like the amount of there there does seem to be a point where multi-year players at Michigan State where Izzo finally just kind of lets them go. Right. And doesn't ride their ass and everything that they do and just lets them kind of play. I would imagine that being the case for Henry this year. Yeah, I mean, he would probably be, what, in line to be a captain next year? Mm -hmm. You would think, right? There's no seniors on the roster other than potentially Tillman. Um, So he's now, I feel like we just think of him as this the young guy on the roster filled with veterans, but that would definitely be flipped next year, and it would be – to a large extent, his team, especially if Tillman were to totally agree, stay in the draft, um, which is a lot of opportunity. I think you could clearly say you're going to do all these things. You're going to be our primary playmaker. It's also a lot of pressure to say, yeah, I do this sometimes and I'm pretty good at it, too. Mm-hmm. I have to prove that I, I can do it in a high usage role for an entire year. Right. Um, so it's kind of a bet on himself in that regard to come back. Do you think him testing the waters? is just to get feedback he's not really serious about it or do you think that he's listening for something to actually consider staying in i mean if they get guaranteed money i think he stays in i don't know if that's going to happen though um but if a couple teams say you know we love you we have a spot for you regardless of whether it's in the draft or whatever we have a guaranteed contract waiting for you i think there's a very real possibility he could stay in if that if that happens um, and you know, are there teams that are going to, we've talked about this before with Tillman, where I think we're in agreement that given these circumstances where teams can't have individual workouts, can't do this, can't do that, you know, scouting departments are more dependent on film than they've ever been, um, in the, in the evaluation process. And like, 
that's advantageous for Xavier Tillman. The more film you watch on him, the more you're going to like because there's all this stuff that doesn't show up on stats and doesn't show up maybe on synergy. Um, I think Aaron Henry, it, not to the extent of Tillman, but is somewhat in the same camp where I think the more you watch him, the more you like him. And it's it's going to start on the defensive end. Um, and it's going to start with how much, how he works his ass off on every possession. He runs his ass off, um, you know, works to get open. I know it, Izzo has always wanted him to turn things up a notch, but I think the guy plays pretty hard. Um, you want, you know, with the more you watch him on tape, you're going to, his rebounding will probably bother you and he could be better. But when you watch him on defense, you know, it's clearly a guy who can guard one through four, who can switch who has great fundamentals and all that stuff. So if there's a team that watches enough film and falls in love, maybe they give him a guarantee, right? Um, but yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, to me, he's a guy on film, and you, you do see all those things, and you see what he can do, and then you're left kind of wanting more, wanting wondering more. why you don't get it all the time. And that's sort of the Aaron Henry conundrum to me is – his best moments, I don't like. I think you're like, well, holy shit, this guy can do all these things that we want out of a six six wing. But then you watch a game where he's kind of a no show, and you're like, well, why does this happen? I don't right? disagree. Yeah, and at the end of the day, he's um, still a, he's a what just under thirty six percent career three point shooter. He only makes like you know. I had one scout say to me, I I want to love Aaron Henry, but at some point you gotta you gotta make shots, you gotta make baskets. You know, and he's averaged uh, or he converted only 6.9 field goals per 100 possessions last year while playing with the best point guard in the country. Um, You know, he still hasn't had that moment of catch, drive, three dribbles and go dunk the shit out of the ball. Right. There's always just this kind of innate hesitancy to his offense that is definitely at the forefront, I think, of most scouting reports. Um but at the same time, if I'm a good team with a good or, or a good franchise with a with a good G League system with, you know, I don't need Aaron Henry next year, but I want him in my system because there's all these great raw parts and he's, you know, he's a commodity. He's a six six athletic wing who can guard multiple positions. You know, it's not that unreasonable to take him and stash him, basically. No, it's not. I. I think from his point of view, though, there's just a lot more benefit to coming back. And no doubt. So he, he increased his usage by 4% mm-hmm. last last season. Um, if he can do that again and do some of the same things, all of a sudden he's a guy you're talking about as a all-Big Ten guy. Right. Not I'd just love like to see his usage. All-Big Ten role player. I'd love to see his usage down the stretch in those like last six to eight games. Um, I think you'd even see another spike there. Um, if you remember, yeah, look at the last eight games. He scored double figures six times, um, averaged about 13 a game. But more importantly, he was taking almost 10 shots a game in those final eight. And for so many times, and for like stretches of his career, there's been these three game stretches where he takes three or four shots. He doesn't get to the foul line at all. And you're just like, what happened? Where is this guy? You know, but he kind of dug his feet in down the stretch. The big thing for him is that his usage doesn't change as much as when he gets shots up instead of turning the ball over. All of a sudden, his shot volume goes up Mm. because you're using a possession when you turn the ball over. And he did. He improved. I feel like his bad games were usually plagued by turnovers. Mm. He had five turnovers against Indiana, four against Penn State. So when he doesn't turn the ball over. Those possessions are ending up with shots or assists right, instead right. of giveaways, and that's a big. If you can focal point offensively, that's a big room for improvement. He said turnover rate over twenty percent back to back years. Hmm. So improving his handle, I think, is really going to be, or just like decision making and aggress, like being more aggressive and turning the ball over less is a hard thing to do when you're taking on a bigger role, right? Mm-hmm. It's easy to turn not turn the ball over in a smaller role, but as you're handling the ball and doing more of that, you're going to – Right. It's hard to make turnover improvement at the same time. Right. And like, I love um, his his Ken Palm comparable. Um, yeah, you're going to say the name in the middle. 
Josh Richardson? No. No. I, no, Josh Josh Richardson's uh sophomore year, or I'm sorry, his junior year at Tennessee. Um like I could see that, and I see a lot of Josh Richardson in Aaron Henry. And Josh Richardson's had a great NBA career. He's a great defensive player, um, who's really kind of found his way offensively. Um, but he took this massive jump forward uh as a senior and that kind of changed things and it made him a real NBA player. It made him a draftable, like a reasonably draftable NBA player. Right. And uh, he needed more of that. Um, It just took some time. And I, I I definitely could see Henry on kind of a similar trajectory. The other name on that list. Denzel Denzel Valentine. Valentine. Yeah. Um, Basically a wing in the same system, right. Who really flourished passing the ball over the next two years in a, more playmaking role. Mm-hmm. I I don't know if I see that same passing right. upside from Aaron Henry, but it's the same system, and I'm sure some of that stuff could come out more as a wing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just something to at least point out. Sure. Uh-huh. So Aaron Henry, I think we both think that he will come back and then. Do you agree with that? I would agree with that. And uh, if I were a betting man, if do you think he should come back. Yes, I feel like each one of these would say what we think players should do and will what do. we think they will do, and then kind of talk about the impact. I think he will and should return. Um, I just think it's a great opportunity for him as a junior. Like I, I, he's someone who I can reasonably see playing himself up to the twenty third pick in the draft, and I just don't think that's even remotely a possibility right now. I, he, I mean, he is back end of the second round undrafted free agent and I can't really imagine anything else than that yeah I can't see him getting picked right now just based on his resume and body of work but I do and I agree he has all the upside to come back so I think this one we both agree pretty much slam dunk yeah and a a massive impact you know like yeah if if he's gone to and Winston and Tillman, throw Kyle Arns in there. Um, I looked it up. That would be 59% of Michigan State scoring, 46% of its rebounding, 67% of its assists, and 430 games of experience out the door. Um, and handing the ball to inexperienced Rocket Watts, inexperienced Joey Hauser, right? He still only played one year of college basketball. I know everyone's really high on Joey Hauser, and so am I, but he still only played one year of college basketball. Um, like, this team is, I wouldn't, I mean, it's a, probably still an NCAA tournament team, but it's relatively borderline, I would say. It's a lot of shots for Rocket Watts. It's a lot of shots for Rocket Watts. I, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's just the one piece that would kind of, all of a sudden you look at it and like everything feels like it's falling apart a little bit, right? When you have Henry, you can just, you lose this spot or that spot, but you can patch together a pretty damn good rotation. You have a dude who's played in a final four to build around. Yes. If you don't have Henry on or Tillman on the roster, you have very little contributors from a team that went to the final four just a year ago, Mm -hmm. right? Like that whole nucleus is gone and Henry would kind of be the bridge to that team and help establish some of those, Right. expectations and whatever else. Yeah, end of the day, even if Tillman goes, you're not going to find many better trios than Henry Hauser Watts. That's pretty good. Right? Yeah. Like I most coaches would take that in a heartbeat. So, um that have that build around it, you you can get things done with that. Um I feel about Michigan State right now the same way I felt about Michigan like 3 weeks ago when we were looking at this roster and you're like, "Man, this could really swing dramatically one way or another." If, you know, the in one world, Isaiah Todd stays on board, Josh Christopher commits, maybe they get, you know, a high-profile grad transfer, Isaiah Livers withdraws from the draft, Franz is staying, suddenly this damn team is, you know, loaded from 1 through 13, and the alternative of that was, or Todd doesn't show up, and decommits, and Josh Christopher doesn't go to Michigan, Right. And it misses on some of the higher profile grad transfers. And 
Isaiah Livers say he stays in the draft, right? There was just these wild swings, um, and that's obviously played itself out. Michigan State right now is the same way. You know, if if in one alternate universe, Xavier Tillman and Aaron Henry are back, you're talking about a Final Four contender. If you're, if you're talking about a different world where both are gone, I, I, I mean, those are two very different basketball teams. And I still yeah. think they're going to make an addition for what it's worth. Um, I still think they'll find someone in the transfer portal. Um, but the I thing don't... about the transfer portal is you're not replacing pros. If you're losing guys to the draft right. and replacing them with transfers, well, there's a reason that's not a one for one trade. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Like in the scenario where it's Henry and Tillman are back and you add an extra guard just to build out your backcourt, like. That's how that's how you want to use the transfer portal, right? You don't want to lose Aaron Henry and Xavier Tillman and get some dude from wherever. I don't know, right? The Mac, the Mac, and and plug him in because it just doesn't work that way. So, um, yeah, Michigan State's fascinating right now. Yeah. So briefly on Tillman, I think that he should stay in. Mm-hmm. I lean that he probably will, based on just what people seem to be saying about his stock. What's your read on that? Uh, I, I am in lockstep with you. Um, I feel like he probably should stay in. Um, I do think his stock could maybe get a couple ticks higher. I don't know. It's not as dramatic as an Aaron Henry, though. Um, I feel like the more... People learn about Xavier Tillman. The more they like him, the more his stock goes up. I see him as a, I see him in that twenty to thirty-five range, which is going to lead to a guaranteed contract, um, guaranteed millions. Right? This is not some bullshit, you know, two-way deal. Like that's he'll get a real contract. Um, he doesn't have. I don't think he has anything to lose coming back to school. Right? Like I think we've talked about this before. It's it's probably a win-win either way. But given his situation with family and all that stuff. But I will say this. Here's an interesting situation, though. Like, if... As long as he stays at Michigan State, considering the conditions right now, with the lockdown, or, you know, it's a national lockdown. We don't know if there's going to be a season next year. Um, You can make the case, like, Michigan State takes care of Xavier Tillman. Because there are all kinds of policies in place for student athletes with children, for student for students with children. There's grants. There's opportunities that you're able to have. Like we we point out that Xavier has two kids, right? At the same time, like he has a. They're going to try to find a bigger apartment for him next year because his family has grown by one. So like he'll get a probably get a a, a bigger place, right? Um, you know they they offer him pretty much they take care of all your needs so like if there's no season next year you could make a case at least that like it wouldn't be that bad to still just kind of be taken care of by the school you know yeah the downside to the whole coronavirus impact i think would be there's probably a larger chance there's no college basketball season than no nba season Mm -hmm. so I think a couple million bucks and sure. guaranteed contract and NBA no healthcare would also probably take care of your family the same way, right? Uh, obviously, if you, the risk would be you go undrafted or don't get a guaranteed contract, then you're really in a bad spot. Like, what if you stay in the draft, pull out your ACL in a workout, yep. uh, not on campus, not covered by medical, whatever else, and then mm-hmm. now you're kind of stuck in this limbo, and that's that's the risk. I would right, say, right, right. Um, yeah, so- I mean, like, if it's being taken 55th and on a two-way deal, you're spending most of your time in the G League, you're away from your family, like, yeah, it, that scenario versus being taken care of by Michigan State, finishing your degree, you know, potentially being a first-team All-American, whatever, blah, 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 and improving your stock, like, there's a case, I think that's an actual, that's a conversation, um, at least, but... I don't see him going that far. I, I, I just think he brings way too much to the table where some smart team is going to take him, you know, late first round, early second, and, and he'll be taken care of. And it's a big difference between 
I want a guarantee and everyone's talking about my stock in an area where I'd get a guarantee, right? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to show, like, it seems like pretty clear that Tillman is A, on the NBA radar and B, projected somewhere in that 20 to 40 range pretty consistently by people who follow this stuff. So it seems like it's he doesn't have to play his way onto the radar and workouts and whatever else. Like, he's in the mix. And mm-hmm. being in the mix, he's a guy, like we just said, you want to watch his film and you're going to like his film. Yeah, uh, You're going to talk to him, you're going to like him, right? It's not like he's going to have a bad Skype interview with the Denver Nuggets, right? Mm-hmm. Like, come on now. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't see that happening. He's not going to hurt his stock even in a limited evaluation process. All right. Okay. Well, we're half an hour into this and we've covered one team. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll speed it up. There's a couple easy teams to cover here. Oh, shit. All right. Let's. Um, do you want to just go down the list now? Do you just want to do Michigan or do you want to wait? We'll do, we we'll do Michigan. Let's do Michigan. Right. Um, um, big news with. Well, not big news. I think it was fairly not startling or surprising that uh franz wagner is not uh exploring the draft but either way good news for michigan that you just, just something you don't have to worry about um yeah not startling but pretty important <laughs> right. i think it's still big news i yeah, mean yeah fair um isaiah liver still out there do you what do you think he will do what do you think he should do i think he should come back to school i don't think he'll be picked um he doesn't seem to really be in that range. I think he probably will stay in. That's just my guess, just based on the way he's talked about it, the way he talked about wanting to declare before the season started. And I think once you, like, if you want to be a pro, I think usually you end up being a pro. So that's just my guess. Um, if I had to wager on it right now, I would say, um, yeah, Isaiah is a smart enough dude who I don't think is going to only hear what he wants to hear. There's a lot of guys that get stuck in that uh, headspace. Um, I think he wants to hear that he's ready to be drafted, but I don't think he's going to hear it. Um, at the end of the day, when the last time he talked to reporters, Isaiah Livers said he's only going to go if he gets a guarantee. And I've said this a number of times. like. I don't see where that's coming from. What NBA team is guaranteeing him anything? Um, I just don't see that happening, especially under these circumstances where, you know, is any team going to guarantee him anything when they're, they can't even have their doctors put their hands on him and actually check him. This guy's had injury problems his whole career. Um, and there's just a lot of question marks there and there's nothing that jumps off the, screen either when you watch him on tape so you've got injury questions and you've got a I wouldn't say pedestrian I mean he's a good college player and he's a good three-point shooter but like I don't see anything where I'm like holy shit that translates to the NBA no doubt about it like that guy's got a he's he's clearly an NBA player I don't see any of that on tape I don't think any NBA team will and he's the four scouts that I've spoken to recently all feel like rather kind of shoulder shrug about Isaiah. Um, so where he's getting a guarantee, I, I, I don't see that happening. So I think he will be back, and I think he should be back. That's fair. Yeah, I mean, I'm not here to say that I disagree that mm-hmm. he looks like a surefire pro. I just think that some of it is just the situation, his age, everything else. Um, that's where I just read into those factors. But as far as what he projects to, I think being six seven, six eight mm-hmm. with a forty percent three point shooter on volume over three years is something that the NBA would look at. Um, I think if he were to come back, I think his feedback would say you need to lose weight, you need to get quicker, and prove that you can be a three. Um, I th- think the situation at Michigan makes that a little tough because um, mm-hmm. there's a chance that Franz Wagner is a better three than Isaiah Livers. That's probably a pretty good chance next year. Yes. Um, I, so where is he getting that opportunity? Yeah, but um, I think that they'll through. both play the same way, though. Like, I think within the offense, he can still essentially play like a three, right? He might have to guard yeah. the opposing four. But who really gives a shit? I mean, there aren't that many like true power forwards anymore. And regardless, you know, he'll be fine. Um, My point is, I think if Isaiah fact- Livers and Franz Wagner are back next year. Who would you bet on to be an All Big Ten player? 
Well, I would probably bet on both, but uh, well, if I had to take one or the other, if I had to take one or the other, I would take Franz. But I would also say at the same time, like the fact that Franz is there also um, makes things a little bit better for Isaiah because if it were Xavier Simpson leaving and Franz Wagner not in the picture, well, who are opposing defenses going to put their best defender on? It's going to be all eyes and all attention on Isaiah. Well, that's not going to be the case because you're going to have to stop. Everything's going to start with Franz from an opposing defensive perspective, right? So he does have a a counterpart, and Michigan's going to have to play through both of them. That's true. You know, you're losing the most ball-dominant point guard in the country, and Eli Brooks is a completely different player. So it, everything's going to have to go through the wings. So... Anything he needs to show, he'll be able to show. I'll buy that. I think for him, being able to slim down and get quicker for would sure. be a huge improvement. Because if you're 6'7", 220, and can guard threes, guard twos, or at least some semblance of being able to, he really struggled in that department. And obviously, he was hurt for the last three months of the year. I think it's pretty hard to say that didn't impact it. Mm-hmm. But he was still at his best guarding power forwards last year. So if he could have some of that defensive versatility, all of a sudden all of his offensive production would look a lot better, right? He'd be a legitimate three and D guy right now. He's basically just a big three point shooter, not a three point shooter and defender. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Okay. Let's get to Illinois. Cause I find that. Let's get to Illinois. This is a good one. Yeah. Um, so obviously Kofi Coburn and uh, Io DeSumo are in the draft right now. Um, I would say the general feeling in the world is that IO will go and Kofi will stay. Um, at the same time, Sam Bassini, who does the mock draft for the athletic says that he did not include IO in his, because he's hearing that he's going to go back to school. Um, if that's the case, First of all, Illinois is going to be pretty damn good next year. Um, he would probably be the – I mean, well, it depends on no. Garza and Tillman, right? Garza, Tillman, Io would be the top three players in the league if all three are back. Um, and if Garza is the preseason player of the year yeah, in bold letters next year. For sure. But if he stays in for some reason and Io's back, it would be Io as preseason player of the year. But regardless um, – This is a tough one um, because, you know, Io has had he, – he, he said it a thousand times about his whole goal of bringing Illinois to the NCAA tournament, blah, blah, blah. And they did it, finished fourth in the league. Um, they didn't do it. Well, I mean, they were going to they the NCAA get, tournament. He didn't get to play in that. He did not tournament. get – but, yes, I mean, he, he accomplished his goal of bringing Illinois back, He but but didn't get the payoff, which sucks. Um and, like, is that really enough to bring him back? Because he's probably a first-round pick if he stays in, right? I think he's probably in that borderline range. Okay. Um, I I don't know. So here's my – I think that there's probably – I think that I would draft Io before Kofi. But if you're Illinois, you would take Kofi back over Io 100 times. I think he's far more important. Do you agree with that? I think Illinois will be kind of a mess again if they don't bring Kofi back. He transformed that entire team. I don't. I wouldn't say that. I would disagree. So you think you can just go from Kofi, who he basically they had to change their entire defense to something that worked, yes. built around Kofi. Uh, they changed their offense to something that worked, built largely around Kofi. And then you're just going to put Georgie back in there and do the same thing, and it's going to somehow be I don't, a working defense? Well, Illinois also loses Alan Griffin, who transferred to Syracuse, Tevian Jones transferred, Kipper Nichols and Andres Feliz are gone. Um, the idea of having Io back as your point guard has to be pretty damn attractive when you have n- – very little in the backcourt at all. Um, you have 
probably one of the best incoming freshman point guards in the league, Andre Corbello, and you have Adam Miller, who's a McDonald's All-American. Those dudes are going to play and play a lot of minutes. Uh, I, I know they're le- they are legit, for sure. Um, a junior Io DeSumo could be a monster. And I know a sophomore a Kofi Coburn could be a monster. Um, but at the same time, like, look – you can at least put Georgie back at the five. Like, Georgie at the four is clearly useless. Um, you could conceivably at least have him at the five um, and just pair, you know, still pair Io and Trent Frazier. I know it looks a lot like the team two years ago, <laughs> but um, yeah, I see your point. But turning down Junior Io DeSumo would be really hard for me to do. I'm not saying you're turning him down. I just if I'm picking one or the other. From an know. impact perspective, you're looking at a guy like – there are very few players who transformed their entire team as much as Kofi Coburn did last year in a way that I didn't even see was possible. Sure. That's all I'm saying. But, like, I feel – I also feel and like I part, also of am why, worried. part of why Kofi was so good is because he's playing with Io DeSumo too. Like – Yeah, I'll give you that. And because he's seven foot, two hundred and eighty-five pounds, he's a monster. He's a monster. You know I love Kofi. Come on now. My only worry is it seemed like Coburn declaring was a bit of a surprise. Like I don't really know, and I worry when guys declare as a surprise that they might stay in as a surprise. Why? Why was it a surprise? Like I, I saw that written that people were. Why was it a surprise that this guy who is a man child in college basketball is exploring his possibilities of going to the NBA? I guess. I mean, you could say that about anyone, but I I just worry. If it was a surprise, sometimes you stay in as a surprise. That's all I'll say. So I think there's a chance greater than people might think that he stays in. It's a surprise because no one's talking about him getting drafted in the first round or anything like that. Right. Whereas to Sumu, it had been telegraphed, right? He went through the process, came back. He clearly was going to declare this year whether he stays in or not. You know what I mean? Sure. If both leave, what is... Illinois. <laughs> Not great. Uh, I I really like the freshman guards, so I think there's enough talent there to figure it out. Like maybe you can fix Georgie. Um, they have a couple of transfers on the wing who are supposed to be. There's the kid decent. Austin Hutcherson, who's the Division two transfer from. He's a six six shooter from Wesleyan, right? I think. I believe so. And then Jacob Grandison from Holy Cross. I mean. Mm-hmm. I, but everything you loved about Illinois last year is gone. Right. Um, I I do like coaching changes they made um, as far as playing more of a pack line style defense instead mm-hmm. of all that pressure bullshit. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't be as excited about that team without Coburn. Agreed. All right. So all right. Io, what should he do? What will he do? I think he should stay. In, should stay, and I think he will stay in. Agreed. Coburn. I think he should come back. I think he probably will come back, but I'm a little worried about it. That sounds about right to me. Um, Like, yeah, I don't know what else there is for him to do in college basketball. I'm sure he could keep developing, but he can develop. When you just have his physical attributes, I think it would be completely reasonable for him to just stay in the draft. Yeah, he got better over the course of the season, too, man. Like, he transformed his game, like, Week by week. It was I thought his numbers dropped off over the course of the season. I mean, maybe they dropped off numbers-wise, but he was doing things that he didn't do early in the year. Like, make well, he, he wasn't as prone to, yeah, he wasn't as prone to foul trouble, and he made it. He made his free throws. And he could play defense. Like, if you watch his pick coverage in November and compare it to March, I think it's probably light years of improvement, right? Like, those are the kind of things that when you're a freshman, especially one who hasn't played basketball a whole lot, like, I think you – was relatively new to the sport. Right. Those are going to improve exponentially, and he obviously has the measurables. Right. I mean, he's he has he still has to learn how to I think play through um, being a defensive focal point a little bit more. If you just look at his shot attempts early on, he was getting so many more, and it was just because teams were playing him differently um, before just loading up on him. And at that point, I think people were still attempting to defend. Bashanis Vili when he played with him and before realizing you just didn't have to guard him. So um, that did not help matters at all. 
But yeah, Illinois could be so good if those guys both come back. Oh yeah, big time. Like top fifteen team, easy. Mm-hmm. For sure. Uh, Indiana doesn't have anyone, do they? Justin Smith. Justin Smith. There you go. Kudos for trying. Three year player. He started a ton of games. I like. I don't think anyone particularly cares that Justin Smith declared for the draft, but I also think Justin Smith is certainly important to Indiana to come back and not do something unexpected here. Like it would be a blow if he stays in for some reason. Yeah, but why is he staying in? I don't. I don't know why, but you never know. What do we think about guys who declare for the draft but don't tell anyone and then just show up on the list? Uh, what do we read into that? You're going for some kind of feedback or something. I don't know. You want to just leave the possibility open. You're not ready to decide to come back to school or you don't want to go back to school. That's another thing. Guys who are just begging for a reason to leave. Yeah, I think or I think maybe the logic is, well, if I'm on the list, people will pay more attention to me. Uh, at Could least be. look at my film, maybe. I don't know. I could certainly see an agent saying that to a guy to convince him to do so. I could see an agent saying anything in the world to any player <laughs> because that's what agents do. Um, What's bigger news? Big, What's bigger news, that Justin Smith declared for the draft or that Trace Jackson Davis didn't was, declare for the draft? <laughs> Trace coming back is big news. Oh. Trace statistically was really good as a freshman. Uh, I think – I'm curious how his game shifts maybe as more of a offensive focal point. Um, he was more of a finisher. They didn't really like play through him, and he was really good in that role. But as a sophomore, I mean, there's a lot of good bigs in the Big Ten, but you got to include him in the mix just as far as his potential. Yeah. Um, I mean, he'll be one of the, the bright young stars in the league next year. I know I'm looking forward to Um to seeing him, but the idea of this roster um, without Justin Smith, uh, like I kind of like Indiana as long as this, you know, as long as he doesn't do anything completely unexpected. Um, I, you know, I they still need to learn how to shoot. Somebody, anybody, would be helpful, right? Um, yeah, even, Indiana, even, even just any semblance of consistent offense and point guard play would be better than what there's been. Because if if you get that, um, you know this is this is the year they need to take some sort of jump forward. Right, three straight years under 500 in the Big Ten for Archie ain't gonna do it. Yeah, Indiana is one of those cases where oh, you were a decent team last year. You bring everyone back just about. You lose the guy who was sort of a loose cannon. Right. Like maybe you'll be better, but I'd love to see them maybe bring in a piece who was going to change something. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like if running it back. Do you really think? Oh man, Indiana is going to be awesome this year. Uh, yeah, I would say is the offense going to be fixed right. suddenly. I don't know. I I don't know about the offense being fixed because they you know. The big question for me is, does Jerome Hunter take some huge step forward? Um, and the fact that he was just healthy all last year, I think, was a major plus. And, you know, now now what happens, right? Because even the guy that we saw, he was getting there. There were, there were moments um, where you kind of saw the dude that you and I envisioned and that, you know, we watched play AAU ball and all that stuff and said, you know, oh, my God, this guy might be a one and done. Um there were moments of that, but rarely sustained. Um, and then Finnessy, you know, like, is he going to take some step forward as a junior point guard? I don't know. Um, he if, needs to stay healthy. If both of those dudes do, then they could be pretty damn good. Um, and if they're not, then they're going to look a lot like the same old, same old. It's a team that in seven of their 11 Big Ten losses last year, they scored 62 or fewer points. Like, the offense was just bad. Um, they were outscored by three and a half points per 100 possessions in the Big Ten. Do we agree they were the most fraudulent team yes. in the Big Ten that was in line to make the tournament last year? Yeah. Didn't I sell them, like, five times when we did by right. ourselves? <laughs> just want to remind you. also put Devontae Green on your preseason All-Big Ten team. So. Oh, I thought he was going to, like, average, like, 18 a game. So did he. So did he. <laughs> Zinger. All right. 
Uh, Justin Smith should return, will return, should return, will return. Fair. Shouldn't have declared. Um, Iowa, Luca Garza. This is a good one for me. I he I, I have all sorts of thoughts on Iowa right now. <laughs> Here's the thing on his like. It, to me, it's not really a decision on what he should do future wise or stock wise or any of that. It's all what he personally wants to do. Like, does he want to go try to, you know, win a Big Ten championship, play in the NCAA tournament, you know, make a run? Because you're, he's not going to do more than he did last year, right? Like, okay, he might be able to average a point or two a game, but like his skill set isn't going to change. He. He is Luca his, Garza. His draft profile will be exact. The exact it's not like all of a sudden <laughs> next year we're going to say, man, Luca Garza is a hell of a defender. Like, no offense to Luca Garza, but that's not happening. Right. And like Luca Garza is great at what he does, and those things are going to stay exactly the same. Um, you can't do much better than Big Ten Player of the Year than receiving a couple National Player of the Year awards, right? It's going to be. In terms of his decision, does he want to be a second round pick now or next year if he's picked at all? Um, am I crazy with that analysis? No, overly I agree simplified. With that. I think that I I lean toward him coming back though, mm-hmm. just as what I think he'll do, just because the life of trying to. I don't think NBA people are really enamored with his game, right. and I don't think the life of I think he'd rather just be back at Iowa for a year being the star and be hope star. that that Iowa sure. team can be special, which I, I, I'm i not sure if they will be to the extent that people might see them on a preseason roster breakdown, but there's certainly some intrigue there. And it to have the best college year of your life and then have it cut short, like, it has to suck, right? Like, mm-hmm. he... They could have done something this year, I guess, right? Like, he would have been talked about a lot in March just yeah. because he gets so many damn buckets. Um, so, I don't know. I I don't see him getting picked in the top 45 if he were to go. Do you? No. I don't think NBA people are crazy about his game. I, d- I don't know how he translates. Yeah, I just don't know how he translates. And, like, the touches that he gets – Like you look at the baskets he gets in college, and then watch an NBA game and see how many times any of that actually happens, right? Like, I mean, sure, but he can score in the post. He can hit threes, like yeah. legitimately make threes at six eleven. I mean, he has some things offensively that you can't teach, but yeah, he gets a lot of sort of old school interior buckets with 12 guys draped on him that you don't get in the NBA. But right. And the you know, sprint down court, post up the first guy who's gets near you at the foul line, back him down and get layups. Like I, I don't watch that much NBA, but I don't see that very often. That's fair. <laughs> and I just don't know how he guards ball screens. Right. More importantly, NBA. that's what I come back to. So if he's back though, um, you're talking Luca Garza, Joe Wieskamp, Connor McCaffrey, C.J. Frederick, Jack Nung, Joe Toussaint, um, Jordan Bannon as a fifth year. It's pretty good. Play, probably not playing defense. Um, that's and that's the thing, right? It's the it's still the team that finished twelfth in the league in defense. It's still the team that went one and six in quad one games. Um, Oof. How, yeah, how good is that's that? How good is Iowa? Um, 97th or worse in adjusted defensive efficiency for four years in a row. Mm-hmm. That <laughs> not a lot of defense for a team for a top ten team. Yeah, right. Yeah, most it's really hard to play offense. And then, like to be fair, they were really good on offense mm-hmm. even last year. But I don't think anyone was lining up to pick them to go to the make a deep run in the NCAA tournament with right. that roster construct. If, um, if you could crawl into Joe, here's a question. If you could crawl into Joe Wieskamp's mind, do you think he wants Luca Garza to come back? I think so. I think he gives him a lot of space offensively and open shots, right? I mean, Wieskamp is the perfect guy to put 
an off ball guard like that with a post up big who dominates the ball is really perfect. I mean, I think they complement each other really well. Do you think Wieskamp wants to just be the guy and have to create offense? I don't think that's his game. No, but uh, there were a lot of games, though, where he was taking six shots, seven shots, eight shots last year. I don't know if that's because of Luca Garza or Joe Wieskamp. Well, I I think it could be a combination of both. That's fair. Um, Luca Garza was taking 18 shots, 17 shots, 28 shots. 21 shots, 15 shots, 21 shots. I can keep going. Um, I'm just saying, Wieskamp has the, it has the skills and probably the profile to be a quote unquote, like kind of leading man somewhere. Um, if Garza is there, it's going to be 20 more shots a game for Luca Garza. That's my only point. I agree that they can complement each other well. At the same time, Garza is such a volume possession guy that a guy like Joe Wieskamp can get a little lost. Yeah. I mean, if you have Wieskamp, Frederick, and Bohannon, who are all probably going to shoot 40% from three around Garza, that offense is going to be ridiculous no in any way you slice it. Yeah. And they finished fifth in the country in the offense in offense last year without Bohannon. But playing Bohannon a bunch of minutes coming off of a hip mm-hmm. procedure, like you're not going to get better on defense that way. Right, but no, no doubt on that. But like also remember, you know, Bahannon did play the first half of the year and has spent the last the, the second half of last year, you know, presumably working out, getting stronger, stuff like that. Um this is not gonna be the guy who's fresh off a hip injury coming back into the year. It's not he sp- got the he got the hip surgery once he shut it down, right? Uh that sounds right. I just, I mean, Jordan Baham wasn't a good defender. He's no. not going to be no. a good defender after a hip operation. Uh, True. Luka Garza is a poor interior defender. Uh, I, I mean, just, you could drop Xavier Tillman onto this team, and it's still not going to be a good defensive team. It just won't be. That's fair. It'd be a fun team to watch, though. For sure. Their, <laughs> their games are going to be wild. Um, score, but, score 90, fall behind by 12. In the last six minutes of the game, and then go to the go to the press that Fran always has in the back pocket. Penn State Iowa last year at the Palestra might have been one of the most watchable Big Ten games of the year. So kudos for that. Mm-hmm. All right, so and they Iowa, lost because they let Penn State score eighty nine points, which I imagine was a season high in the league without looking it up. <laughs> nope, they put ninety on Ohio State. Oof. Okay. All right, let's get into Maryland. Yeah, Jalen Smith. I think he he's like in. Will, in. Has he signed? He's like for sure in. I think he's in. In yeah, yeah. I I can't see him coming back to school at this point. And oh baby, that's going to be a mess of a roster in College yes. Park. Yes, it I is. feel for Turgeon after missing out on like. He missed out, missed out on Aiken. Goodwill. I think missed this out team Aiken, was good. right? Didn't he? And he missed out on the kid who transferred to Carolina. He missed out on. If you take a transfer, I think Maryland missed out. Uh, Santo mm-hmm. Silva transferred mm-hmm. to Texas Tech. I think Maryland was in there. Uh, Maryland was in there with seemed like every transfer and has not made any roster additions, as far as I know, as like in terms of impact transfer. Uh. This team is going to be messy. You're taking they got, all they got the, the kid, uh, Jarius or Jarius Hamilton from BC. Okay, who technically will have to sit out, but they're going for a waiver, or the rule will be changed. I wouldn't be surprised if he plays. He's a six eight kid who averaged like nine and five or something like that for a bad BC team. Um, but he played ACC basketball. Like he'll be able to step in and give him minutes in what in mm-hmm. a front court that loses. Anthony Cowan, they lost both of the Mitchell brothers, right? They tra- they left midseason. Um, that other kid, Joshua Tomek, am I saying his? Tomaich. Tomaich. Um, he would have been probably a rotation player this year, but he transferred. Um, I don't think he's picked where he's Basically, going. Basically, they're going to try to build a team around the three enigmas. Correct. Who never quite 
did anything when you wanted him to next two stars. And now you're going to try to say Aaron Wiggins, Daryl Morsell, and Eric Ayala guide this team. On one hand, those three they all played a ton of minutes as upperclassmen, but they also just haven't done it. So I, ugh, I don't know. Those three combined to shoot 37.6% from the field in Big Ten play. The three of them. Not great. Who passed Who passed the ball to them on every shot they took last year? Though right. That's the scary part. Yeah, and I mean, gone. I and, and you're you're essentially replacing Anthony Cowan and Jalen Smith with Marcus Dockery, who's going to be a freshman, um, who's like ranked like 200th in the country, and I, I don't even know who's is is Mariel going to play center seven two and talented like but he's games ridiculously raw like yeah i mean he's gonna get pushed her all over the place um yeah they're they're in trouble i mean i love Dante scott um but he's like he's a six seven sophomore he's like a great glue guy player right you're not a guy you're build around right now um yeah i mean it's gonna boil down to whether wiggins morcel and Aya can all up their shooting percentage by like 10 points each in some cases more without a point guard passing Uh, the ball i think they'll make at least i I think they'll make a couple more additions in one way or another right if that if that rule passes on may 20 they'll be the biggest buyers i i i can't imagine they won't get another guard somewhere along the line at least they need a center too while they're at it so two months ago, basically, they <laughs> yeah. won the Big Ten. Yeah. Didn't get to play in the NCAA tournament. Will always be judged as they would have flopped in the NCAA tournament because Mark Turgeon is their coach. And now they're just replacing the whole roster. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's it's tough. And they lose the two guys that entire team was built around. I, I can't see them making the NCAA tournament with this roster next year. No chance. Know? Even if, oh, I mean, if Jalen Smith was back, yeah, they would. Yes, they would. Yeah, that. But I could see that. But no, Callen, no Smith, my lord, that's not good. Um, all right, Minnesota. Minnesota, Marcus Carr, and Daniel Oturu. Oturu is in. And o- in. Correct. Marcus Carr is testing. Minnesota's Ross. <laughs> Minnesota's have uh, quite the. Quite the off season here. Um, they got three transfers coming in, uh, who are all decent. Like put up real numbers in non power conferences. Drew Peterson, a wing from Rice. Uh, Brandon Johnson, who people are probably familiar for, he's kind of a brute uh, forward from Western Michigan. He's a grad transfer, Western, Western Michigan, and uh, Liam Robbins, who was an All Valley. Uh, seven foot center from Drake. Um, then they lost Peyton Willis. He transferred to College of Charleston as a grad transfer after starting like twenty five games or something. Um, there's a lot going on with this roster, but the big thing, like Carr's decision, is massive. Like if Carr's back, you put him with Kalsher, right? Say they get these other guys eligible. Um, Jamal Mashburn Jr. is coming in. Like maybe you can it's have some team, semblance. Think, you can have some semblance of a competitive roster. I think mm-hmm. if Carr's gone, um, I, I top bottom bottom three finish, bottom four finish probably for Minnesota. Yeah, and I don't really have a good sense. I mean, I assume Marcus Carr's just testing the waters because. I don't really see him getting picked, but he also seems like he plays like a guy who's quite confident in himself. I would so, say uh, that. I, I would worry a little bit. Um, he's also already three years into college, right? Right. Um, so would he be a guy who you look at and say, man, maybe he's just ready to go on to something else? I don't think so. But either way, I think he probably ends up coming back. He is and he's capable i think you can build a roster around marcus Carr, right he's a ball screen guy he he could fit in with these other pieces all right i just 
just bring misfits from other mid-major leagues. I don't know if that's really a sustainable way to win in the Big Ten for Minnesota, even with Marcus Carr. No, I agree. Like, this is not – these are not year eight moves, right? At this point, like, you want to have guys stepping into roles. You want to have um, some semblance of a program. Uh, not surprisingly – a guy with a 48 and 82 overall record in the Big Ten does not have that. It's still, they've always just been plugging holes at Minnesota. And it goes all the way back to like year one for Patino, where when, when you look at what he brought in in his first season, and w- when he had, you know, he's a first year coach and he had a lot of rope where you can bring in freshmen, right, and start to build a program. And instead, he went the transfer route. He went the grad transfer route. Brought in all these plug and play guys, and you see Hoiberg doing it right now at Nebraska, um, as opposed to bringing in freshmen, starting to build, and then you know by year three you get old and you try to find success that way. Um, it's never been that way at Minnesota, and this is what you get when you play that way. But he did win the NIT in year one. There you go. So he's got that going for him. Yeah. What are you doing year two? Not great. Six and twelve, <laughs> eight and fifteen. There you go. Eighteen and fifteen. Sorry. I I agree. I don't. I'm not saying I'm supporting how he's built the team. I think it's time for Minnesota to move on. Uh, yeah. He's got way more rope than Tubby Smith, who did just as much in his six years there. Um, I. I don't know. You could argue that I I didn't even love this Minnesota team. Well, they this weren't going to make the tournament. Been better. Yeah, they were. At yeah, the end of the day, the top 30 you, had, team. you had Marcus Carr and the losing Daniel Turu, and you were going to miss the, the tournament. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, not great there, uh, Richard. Ohio State is an interesting one. Um, Caleb Wesson is in the draft. I think he's technically testing the waters, but I think pretty most people expect him to stay in. Stay in um, the draft. Say in the draft, yeah. yes. Yeah, 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 I agree. I think that's pretty much a consensus, and that was the plan going into this year. C.J. Walker, I was surprised to see him declaring for the draft. I'm not really sure. He was quoted. I saw Adam Jardy wrote it. I don't know where he got the quote from. I think, like, C.J. Walker was on some teleconference or something where he, like, basically just came right out and said, I just I just want to get feedback from the pros to see, like, what I need to work on. Um, I, I don't know why he needed to declare for the draft to do that. I think – on this podcast, we probably could have recorded five minutes of audio to send to him, but um, yeah, th- he'll be back. Um, and then Alonzo Gaffney yeah. in the draft, but transferring. He is right? also in the transfer portal. Yes. Yeah. That's just so living in living in all the worlds, man. That's the move. I'm going both. I'm going into the draft and the portal. It's a mid-major move right there, but uh, either way, it's a tumultuous offseason for Ohio State. Um given all the transfers out, losing potentially losing Caleb Wesson. I think it's the right move for Wesson to stay in just based on, I think when you go through the process, get a bunch of feedback, go through it again, show that you've improved. At this point, you kind of are what you are as a junior. Um, I, I think he's an intriguing piece. I've never been a huge Caleb Wesson fan, but he's a legit shooter. And the way he shot the ball this year was pretty damn impressive to me. Um, so... I, what do you think of his stock? Um, I mean, I think I agree with you. Like, I, I think he, I think what you saw is his junior year. Like, that's going to be his senior year. Um, yeah, I don't see him busting out into some 23 point per game, 11 rebound, you know, all American candidate type guy. Um, but, I agree. I think he was decent his his junior year. Um, I think he goes just because it's time to go. You know, I think he was pretty close last year and ended up coming back probably in part to play with his brother for another year. Um, obviously, Andre's now graduating um, and the program's going in a different direction. So, um, yeah, I, I think... He will go and probably should go, even though I, I, Sam Bassini has him at like the 55th pick in the draft. And I see Caleb Wesson being the 55th pick in the 2021 draft, too. 
Sounds right. The, what's your take on Ohio State? I, For some I, reason, I have no idea. <laughs> computers like them. I see them on some top 30 type lists. I, I'm not real excited about this roster. I think probably have a lot of confidence that Holtman can build a good defense out of it because that's just kind of what right. he's done. But man, well, you lose. So you lose Wesson. You lose both Wessons, right? And like I know Andre Wesson's numbers don't jump out at you, but like losing Andre Wesson is not a small deal. For this team, he's still a guy who played a million minutes and did everything that nobody else wanted to do. Um, and shot forty two percent from three. Yeah, uh, you obviously lose DJ Carton, who you didn't play with over the back half of the year, but he's off to Marquette. Gaffney's gone. Luther Muhammad's going to Arizona State. Um, uh, like, how long is it going to take? For, first of all, it's going to take a while for this group to gel because there's all kinds of pieces going in all kinds of directions. Um, and you know how good Seth Towns? I I think Seth Towns is pretty good. Still need to see it. Um, and then all the returning pieces. I really like EJ Lydell. Um Nothing else really kind of gets me going though when I look at this team. But I, I understand why some people are buying it. But I don't, no bigs. I don't know. Yeah. In a Big Ten that's going to be pretty interior mm-hmm. centric, it would seem. So it'll be interesting. I'm really interesting to see a team with no bigs because I just like small ball, and they're going to play Kyle Young at the five, I assume. Probably like Kyle Young and EJ Liddell. EJ Liddell, yeah. As six, seven, four, and five men, which is intriguing to me. Um, so they they could play like an all six, seven lineup, basically, right? You have Seth Towns, you have the Cal transfer. Um, it, it's an interesting roster. Uh, it doesn't get me real excited. I Like, on Torvik right now, they're projected third in the Big Ten, which just seems way too high for me. Right. But I could be missing the, bo- the boat here. Too many unknowns for me to feel good about, at least. It's fair. Yeah. So then there's five schools with no early entries. Is that right? Wisconsin, Nebraska, Northwestern, Rutgers, and Penn State. Mm-hmm. And that's basically our no our league. We even done we didn't do Purdue. Oh, Purdue, no gel, no gel Eastern. Back, back in the draft, back in the draft. Uh, should stay, will stay. Do you think no gel Eastern's uh junior year really showed the improvement based on the feedback he received as a sophomore in the draft process? Uh, I don't think he showed the uh, shooting and ball handling that people were quite looking for uh, i don't think so no no what do you think about harms transfer interesting uh i didn't expect byu i mean i i guess i get it but like i don't think byu is a guaranteed tournament team i purdue probably could be in the picture to make the tournament. So like BYU you, is going to lose is is Yoli or whatever his name. He's going pro, right? He was a senior, right? I thought he was a junior. I could be wrong. No, he was a senior. And TJ Hawes, they'll leave, lose too, right? Yep. And That's Jake Coulson was a senior. And they're a whole like starting lineup for seniors. They lose what? Th- three senior starters. And a senior six man. Yeesh. And yeah, I thought he was playing the league. That, Kentucky. I think Kentucky thought he was going to go to Kentucky. Can't be wooed by Jordans, man. How about it? So can't be wooed by sneakers and a nice storm. He's going to go to BYU instead. Wait, I, he'll go, I, the, he'll go some, down there and work with my boy Chris Burgess. Yeah, is there some kind of connection? I have I'm, no. I don't. I don't I'm know. I haven't like, read I anything. Know. I mean, Matt Harms looks like he'll. Fit in well and <laughs> oh. <sighs> you have any feeling I, on Purdue? I mean, I uh, not that I can really get excited about. Maybe they won't lose as many close games as they did last year, right? Like right. the 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 positive outlook would be, hey, they are probably better than their record last year, whereas a team like Indiana was worse than its record. So in that case, 
like Aaron Wheeler can't shoot that poorly from three again next year. Right. Maybe he makes shots and then he's the guy you think. I I know there's a lot of Travion Williams fans. I'm not a huge Travion Williams guy. Mm-hmm. I don't know what your ceiling is with him really. I don't know. They'll be de- they'll they'll play defense. They'll be solid. I don't know who's gonna take them to the next level though. That's fair. That's fair. All right. Um, do you want to touch on anything else before we uh, wrap this thing? I think that the Big Ten favorite is the team with no one on this list, Wisconsin. Agreed. But I'm not sure that they. Uh, I want to get your take on. Are they uh, like a? Final Four type of team to you, oh. or like a a team that wins the Big Ten and gets no. the six. You know what I mean? Like I mean, how good? I, I think Wisconsin outkicked its coverage a little bit last year. Um, they were just they were shooting the shit out of the ball for the last three or four weeks. Um, that might end up, I think, people going a like a touch too high on Wisconsin. I think they're. A safe pick for the favorite. I don't think they're a runaway, obvious, like the way that we talked about Michigan State last year. I am in no way ready to talk about Wisconsin that way going into this year. I like them. I think I think they're definitely, you know, a five seed or better in the NCAA tournament. Definitely in the mix for the Big Ten championship. I don't I don't say they I don't think of them as a clear favorite in the league. Yeah, they're gonna have five seniors basically five seniors and i don't know if any they could probably be a big 10 favorite with no one on the all big 10 preseason team which so what does that tell you that tells me i don't love them that's what it tells me (laughs) says i'm worried i i don't know what to do with them is what it says i they're going to be a pain in the ass to play against for everyone in the big 10 Mm -hmm. um they bring in some like they don't just bring back last year's roster, which I like, because they bring in some freshmen who are pretty good. Ben Carlson, and they've, Johnny Davis, I think, is like these. Like these are good recruits for sure. Wisconsin. Um, but man, are they going to just shoot forty five percent from three every game? Maybe. I, experience is important, especially in a college basketball season where there's not a lot of maybe great talent that you're going to get super excited about. Like, how many pros are there in the Big Ten next year? Not a ton, no. depending on how this list shakes out. But, but it, yeah, they shot like forty-two percent on threes over the last like that whatever winning streak they had at the end there. How many how many games was that? Uh, let's see, like eight. I, you know, who shot forty-one or for like forty-two percent on threes in like an eight-game stretch. Last year, it was Michigan in the beginning of the year, and they were ranked third in the country. And then they <laughs> had, to, had to battle their way through league play. Um, to be fair, though, like... I mean, Wisconsin's good. I'm these not, guys I'm not are to, career high 30s shooters on volume. I agree. I'm just saying, like... I'm not saying it's lightning in a bottle, but I'm saying Wisconsin was playing over a little bit over its head in the last couple weeks of the year, right? Has to. Uh, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, to peg them as the clear cut favorite, I'm not just not ready to say it. It's it's that clear. I'll buy that. All right. I I think we should probably this is probably the longest podcast we've done in a while. Hour and eighteen minutes. Oh, not bad. Not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, all right, but we will wrap it on that. Um, Folks, we appreciate you listening. Make sure you subscribe to UM Hoops. Make sure you subscribe to The Athletic. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast. Um, Leave a review if you would be so kind. Uh, Throw us some feedback if you like. And uh, be sure to support your local restaurants. And uh, when things open up, tip those bartenders and servers well. See ya.